Hey, Sonia, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about your story and help share your story with our audience. So um, I really want to start first at the beginning. So tell me about growing up in San Diego and um, some of the things that you did up until your senior year of high school. Yeah, so um, growing up, I had a passion for violin. So I've played violin for over seven years up until today and um, I loved giving back to the community so I was involved with the American Red Cross and I made my own club called Project Feed which helped give back to the homeless shelters in downtown San Diego and I was also involved with honors and AP classes and that was kind of like the whole gist of my high school. Nice. So yeah. you stayed pretty busy then I guess. Yeah, huh? <laughs> very busy. Yeah. That's super cool. And at if you could reflect back on that moment uh, leading up to senior year high school, what what really made you happy and, and how do you think you defined happiness at that time? Um, so I guess what really made me happy is just being surrounded by friends and family and having always just kind of having them be there for me whenever I needed them in terms of advice or just kind of growing into the person I am today and um, that that really kind of structured my happiness was having that community be there for me. Okay, so, awesome. Yeah. So it's your senior year of high school. You're dealing with everyday high school, senior year high school problems, yeah. uh, applying for colleges, yeah. getting ready for graduation. And then one day your mom notices a bump, correct? Right, yeah. So my uh, when I was working at Blaze Pizza, my hair used to be super long, um, and it was tied up when I got back home from work. And my mom noticed a huge bump on my right shoulder. And I didn't really think about it or see it, mainly because I was just so busy with like you said, like everyday high school, senior stuff, applying for college applications, you know, leading to clubs, practicing violin in hopes of getting to a music conservatory school. And I was just super busy. So I just never really noticed it and um, kind of like looked at myself in the mirror. And um, so once my mom noticed the bump, um, we went straight to the emergency room and they said that it could be, you know, either a disease or an infection, but nothing too serious. So I didn't really think of it as something you know, really life-changing. And so after that, um, they did some CT scans and they had suggested that we go and get a biopsy at the Rady Children's Hospital. So um, when I was getting the my biopsy, my parents, um, prior to getting my biopsy, my parents had spoken with a doctor beforehand that, um, and the doctor had told them that it, it is cancer and it's a form of cancer. However, I had no clue at all that it was going to be that and that it was going to be um, one of the biggest changes in my life. Um, so when after the, they did the biopsy, um, they told me that I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. So it was stage two. Um, they said that it was curable, thankfully, but uh, the doctor said that I only had four weeks if I didn't start treatment that night. So I had to drop everything to survive, so that meant um, have either not applying for colleges, waiting to graduate, you know, kind of pushing everything back. And that just wasn't really the way that I wanted it to be because I was just kind of starting my whole college career, figuring out who I am as a person and really kind of starting a new life, you know, a really great life. And so it was definitely um, a big shift hmm. in my life. I I'm thinking about my senior year couldn't even imagine hearing the word cancer. Uh, how did that make you feel? Um, when the doctors first told me, I was really speechless. I had nothing to say. I was emotionless. I didn't know what to do, say, feel, act. I remember that that was kind of like my initial feeling was just kind of, I just did not feel like a human being with feelings. And so um, a couple of day, like a couple of days kind of having it being more and more processed and sunk in was when I really started to get like emotional and so I had I had no clue I really feared the unknown and that's what made me so emotional is because I didn't know what the next day would bring me and I I would I remember just I remember first being hopeful and then I would get sad and it was just kind of like that back and forth of you know everything's going to be okay no matter what the circumstances but at the same time being really like upset about the whole situation so um, once I went started going through the treatment was it was just kind of that constant back and forth mixed feelings 
for for myself and in the audience as well what what is Hodgkin's lymphoma so Hodgkin's lymphoma is a type of um, lymphoma cancer which is basically the lymph node areas swell up and um, uh, it rapidly divides really quickly and so there's four stages to that and then every two weeks it goes up a stage mm. and what does treatment look like and how illustrate for me what it was like being in the hospital every day like what what was what did the routine look like and what did treatment look like so for me um i they i was the treatment for me was chemotherapy and radiation therapy um the hardest part of the treatment was the chemotherapy because it was i would describe chemotherapy as you know a best friend and your worst enemy combined because it was your best friend in a way that it was supposed to help you and cure you but in a way it was your enemy because it provided you with the worst feelings that one could ever imagine physically and so in terms of the chemotherapy I was on that for five months and so I was in and out of the hospital depending on how I felt depending on how long the doctors wanted me to stay in for certain chemicals and um, unfortunately there was a lot of different um, side effects to that so that kind of consisted of um, either craving so much food to the point where you gain 30 pounds in a month or it was you were so your mouth was so swollen to the point where you couldn't eat anything for weeks so it was just kind of, you didn't really know what the next day would bring so you had no idea whether it would be that feeling of fatigueness or feeling of wanting to munch on things constantly and still feel like you're not full yeah and so on top of that being and on top of that losing when losing your hair um 70 percent of people who go through chemotherapy lose their hair and so i was one of the 70 i was part of that 70 percent and um, I lost all my hair, but thankfully it's growing back, yeah. so it's really exciting. Um, but it, that was definitely really hard for me personally, because I was I was 17 years old, and um, it was just kind of like be, being bald as a girl is really just kind of something that you don't. It's just a really hard concept to explain because it's just you you see everybody you know normal having hair and then like there's there's you you either have to wear a headscarf or you you want to feel strong enough to be able to say I'm fine with you know who I am and so it was just kind of really hard to figure out who you are you know with that um, physical aspect of you taken away mm. and I would assume that would be so challenging for anybody but especially challenging for a young adult where exactly I'm not image matters image, yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. What what else do you think people young adults who um get cancer what what else do you think is a unique challenge to them? Um definitely um the friends aspect because um number 1 your friends don't really know how to approach a situation. Um even adults who are past the young adult phase it's it's just a really hard concept to grasp because it's it's kind of like a life or death situation and everybody just freaks out and you don't really know what to do. And even I myself, my first initial feeling was just speechless because I had no idea what to think, do, say to myself. So I think a unique challenge to that was how my friends were able, like my friends trying to figure out how to support me. And so on, on top of that, going off of that, um, my uh, my friends attempted to visit me in the hospital, but unfortunately, during the times of flu season and things like that, they weren't able to. And so that was one of the struggles be, um, because I really wanted to see them and talk to them and um, you know text message. It, it's it's good, but it's not that human feeling, that human interaction that you really have. Having them visit you kind of just makes everything worthwhile and you just kind of feel more hopeful rather than just a, yeah. a text message, hey, how are you, you know? Mm -hmm. so. I'm sure there was a lot of tough moments, but first I would love to hear of maybe one of your favorite moments that you had in the hospital. Yeah, um, one of my favorite moments, um, even though it is sad to think about, um, I did have to stay in the hospital um, during Christmas time. So, um, on Christmas day, 
Um, I had a bunch of goodies come from all the nurses and all the doctors and a lot of donations. And it was, it, it was actually really nice because it was all the things that a 17 year old girl would want. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, there was like a target gift card and, um, just a bunch of different little things that really kind of made you feel like, oh, this is actually like really thoughtful and really, really meaningful. And so waking up to that and seeing that surprise was a really great feeling, knowing that there's still that support, even though you're lonely in the hospital and like you're, I'm staying with my mom and things like that. Um, it was just a really nice kind of warm and happy feeling. Yeah. So. so you had no idea that any no of the idea. No idea. No. Santa be there? Claus came. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. That's so really neat. That, yeah, those were one of the one of the happiest yeah. moments so, while undergoing treatment. Uh, inevitably, I want to ask the reverse question now too. What about one of your toughest moments? Toughest moments. Um, Health-wise, um, was definitely when it's it's kind of like even hard to grasp now and think about. But it was the moment when I wasn't able to stand up and walk to the bathroom, even though it was five feet away. It was just something of feeling so fatigued and so and so much pain to the point where you're not able to stand up and do something so simple and so basic. And that was that was one of the hardest struggles health-wise. And then um, mentally, a um, couple of different things um, mentally and um, emotionally was the, the friend aspect, you know, of you really think that people are going to be there for you and they're there during the treatment. And then once you're off treatment and you're cancer-free, they don't talk to you anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like, were, were you really my friend because you wanted to be there for me or were you just trying to see how I'm doing because I had cancer. And so that was definitely a struggle. I had to really figure out who my real friends are and just kind of understand like who's who are the real people that are going to be there for me in the long run. Sure. And then on top of that, you know, as being a senior, I still wanted to graduate. And so um, trying to do my schoolwork on top of the treatment and on top of college applications, I, I still wanted to push myself and I still wanted to graduate on time with all the rest of, with the rest of my classmates and that was definitely a struggle of trying to work with teachers and having them accommodate with my needs was definitely a struggle as well mm. um, and I'm sure a lot of people most of your friends wanted to be your biggest supporter but I'm assuming they struggled to know how to support you what if you were to give some advice to a supporter out there, maybe their friend or family recently was diagnosed with cancer, what yeah. what, what would you tell them? Um, I would definitely recommend that um, one number one reaches out to them and gives them um, kind of t gives them a message and says, "Hey, can I call you and like talk to you? I heard so something so and so is going on and." this has happened and I'm really sorry to hear, can I give you a call? And then once you give them the call, you say, like, you listen to them, hear what they have to say, um, and just kind of have this regular conversation. And, and then afterwards, after they explain everything and what's going on in their situation, how long the treatment is, things like that, you say, hey, like, when can I see you in the hospital? I'd love to see you. As When you make that initi initiation and that contact, that reach out, that's when the person who's diagnosed feels li like they don't have to have something on their shoulders and say, how am I going to approach them? How, how do I ask them to come and visit me when I don't want to, you know, be in that position for them or have them be in that position for me? So definitely making that, that, in that initial like, hey, I would love to see you. I know you're going through this treatment. Let me know when you're feeling okay and I, and I want to come and visit you, whether it's in the hospital or not just kind of having that hey like I want to see you you know I know right right now is a pretty hard time um but just kind of just being there for them like kind of like as a normal lifestyle even though it isn't I think that's one of the greatest takeaways and sure and advice that I would give so essentially what you're telling me first address the elephant in the room right away and and treat treat you no different than they would want to be treated exactly be intentional about setting setting up time to come and see you and, yeah. and understand when the appropriate time is yeah and and then just giving you normal conversation I'm yeah. sure yeah definitely <laughs> not yeah. uh that, I'm sure you got pretty tired about explaining your situation <laughs> and your current moments and you just right. wanted to 
know what was happening yeah. out of the four walls of the hospital and let's have fun and normal yeah. conversations that you would want to be having if the circumstance was different. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And definitely um, another takeaway going on top of that is when um, even if the, per the, the person diagnosed may not reach out to you a couple weeks giving them their little timeline, it's still important to kind of still send them a message sure. or maybe like put flowers on their door or just anything, that, any little thing that they like or um, kind of that you know that would make them happy mm -hmm. I think um, is a really great thing. Just kind of a, just a little magic yeah. in their life, you know, with all that's going on. Was, was there a favorite gift, gift that you, you got while you were in the hospital? Um, definitely. Not to put anyone on the spot <laughs> here. I'm sure you got lots of great things, but. Um, I think, no, the greatest gift of all is definitely having them visit me in the hospital. Mm. That's that's the big, the greatest gift ever. I remember my uh, really close friend Courtney. She said, "Hey, I'm I'm free today. I would love to come and see you." And that initi that initial contact, that reach out, like not not so much that it was out of nowhere, but it's like I haven't talked to her, you know, like in a week or so. And then for her to like want to say, "Hey, I want to visit you," I think that's the greatest gift of all is just having them be there, you know, gossip, talk, you know, play a game, anything, yes. you know, as a young adult. Um, it was it's, it was a great feeling because yeah. I, I'm I've just have I just have such strong connections with my friends and family mm -hmm. that that's that's the best gift for me personally yeah. so. did you get to hang out with a lot of other young adults while you're in the hospital what did you spend time with them um, for me actually um, mine mine was the situation for me was a little different because the opinion that I had at the time was I really did not want to speak with anybody who like also was going through cancer and there was um also a lot of younger children that I um was um w like that I was hospitalized with so it there was not it was there was not a lot of people around my age that I'm able to even talk to you know and kind of who, who's going through the same thing yeah. it's um even though it, it might be the same um form of a diagnosis um I'm a 17 year old girl talking to a five-year-old boy it's it's really like we are both at such different stages of life that it's I thought about it and I did not reach out at all to anybody so yeah, and I feel like just being a part of this organization I I understand what some of the settings look like but I don't think a lot of people realize there's probably not a ton of people within your age range that you yeah. would want to have conversations with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, not common. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, on a happier note, tell me about what I'm assuming is probably one of your most anticipated days, your last day of treatment. What what did that day look like? Oh, the last day of treatment, I was, it was just counting down the days because, um, tr so when, when, when you're going through chemotherapy and radiation therapy, Sometimes your blood level count might be low to the point where they have to postpone the treatment. So it was definitely um, the, the countdown calendar was really tentative because you never truly knew what that last day of treatment was mm -hmm. and when you would finally be fully cancer free. And so the last day of treatment for me was it was just so emotional. I was just holding my mom's hand and I was like the last couple of minutes of the, the chemicals. Um, being injected into me um, it was just the greatest feeling of just having that all stop and being able to leave the hospital knowing that I'm okay and knowing that I'm gonna start a new life with a, a new perspective and a new mindset on everything and so it was that was that was how that day of be, being fully cancer free looked like so in terms of the timeline from omitted until your last day what what, what was the specific timeline um, as far as, um, what? how many, how the duration, yeah, yeah, yeah it was about, um, five months. Okay. Yeah. Five months. So I remember the, the last tech for me, how I took it was the last day of treatment. I, I called that as the last day of chemotherapy treatment because the radiation is more so like confirming that everything's fully gone. Mm -hmm. Um, because the, the radiation therapy did not have any side effects thankfully so whereas the chemotherapy did so um, that's kind of how I approach it but the the total duration was five months so that was early <laughs> fall and then you got out in like February yes. time yeah, okay exactly. so and, and you're trying to keep pace with school right now yes, yeah uh, so you missed 
about half a semester on on each semester of your um, exactly of senior year yeah so you get out of treatment you're going back into school yeah. and I love this story <laughs> tell me about how your classmates welcomed you back to school so it was all a surprise and I I personally love surprises yeah. and so um, you know after being done with treatment like the minute I got done I asked my doctor can you sign my doctor's note to be able to go back to school? And so beginning of March, I came back to school and um, I, I drove and I went, when I was about to park, I noticed the front entrance of the school had a huge poster that said, welcome back sauna in pink and purple colors. And I'm like, that's the cutest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had no idea too, which is like, like you could just see the smile on my face right now. Like it was just such a great feeling. Like, knowing that oh my gosh like everybody knows I'm back and like I thought everybody forgot about me like it's just like super mixed feelings of and of like a lot of happiness and just full of emotion it was the best one of the best days of my mm. life um seeing that the poster out there and then on top of that um as I was going to my different classes for the day each class also had a po pink and purple colored poster uh, saying either welcome back sauna or queen sauna or the date that I got back which was March 14th um the arrival of sauna and so it was just like such a beautiful feeling of like being welcomed in such a really cool and surprising way and yeah definitely having that community support and without asking for anything you know I think that's one of the greatest ways again to you know provide that support to a young adult facing cancer mm. yeah. that's such a beautiful story you went to <laughs> Carlsbad right yes yeah mm, that's shout out to Carlsbad High School yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when was there a moment and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there was a moment that you finally reflected one day and you <laughs> thought wow I haven't really thought about cancer I can I use the word, I feel normal again? Is that, yeah. was, was there a moment that you ever felt normal? Um, it's actually um, recently when I truly re like reflected on everything. It was about a month ago, um, which is crazy to think about because I'm, I've been over two and a half years cancer free. But the, the true time where I, I truly felt normal again was about like a couple weeks ago because you know, I, I gained a lot of weight from my treatment and um, also the amount of time it took to, for my hair to grow back to something that I, I truly felt like, you know, feeling like a girl, you know, mm -hmm. and feeling like myself because my hair used to be so long. Um, it was definitely the time I felt normal again being in college and the gist of things without having those special accommodations from the university or the school. Um, yeah, so definitely recently was when I actually started to truly feel normal is, you know, going back into um, a healthy, active lifestyle, losing weight and losing weight in a healthy way, of course, and um, having my hair grow back, going to university, um, it's, it's all, it all comes together. And that's truly the time I really like feel like sauna. Yeah. As we're wrapping up here, I really want to hear about your Coachella experience through the Make-A-Wish Foundation and then yeah. how that kind of led into your, your current passion right now. Yeah, so um, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, um, I, my doctor referred me to um, this nonprofit organization and I never, I never really thought that I would be a wish kid one day and have my life changed forever. And so um, I, they, the, my wish granters granted my wish to go to Coachella. So they provided an all um, paid expense trip um, to go with three of my close friends and my family. So that included my parents and my sister. So there were seven of us total. And so they went above and beyond my expectations and they provided me with VIP access, a, a golf cart to go backstage at any of the <laughs> concert venues, um, a $3,000 check to spend anything that I wanted. It was, it was the best, one of the best experiences of my entire life and to have an organization do so much for me um, was, was such a beautiful feeling and knowing that there's people out there that really want to give back to those who are struggling through something specific. I think it's really cool. And so I really wanted to give back as much as I could. So my passion for philanthropy definitely shifted. Um, and 
uh, I felt that I needed to place my a strong focus on those battling critical illnesses, specifically children and young adults. And so here I am today um, helping the Make-A-Wish Foundation as an intern and ambassador for them and as well as Be Present organization, yeah. um, being able to be um, to serve as an ambassador and provide provide the cancer experience um, in a way where we are able to help young adults, you know, going through tough times and more importantly, a unique time because it's the stage of, you know, figuring out who you are and it's also um, the stage of, you know, not knowing what's to come. And so I'm definitely very, very, very grateful to be able to serve as an ambassador and to be able to you know, incorporate my personal experience and yeah. change the world or be present. That's cool. That's cool. So before I ask my last question, tell me who, what, what was the, what was your favorite set that you saw at Coachella? That <laughs> my favorite set, definitely Mac Miller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mac Miller, he, I've already listened to his music before. And so him on stage, he had the most energy that I've ever seen. And so I was just jumping on my feet all the time, like the entire concert. And I, I was surprised I didn't pass out after, but it was like just that the energy is what really got me going. And his music was um, the songs, the songs that he performed then was the songs that I listened to throughout my treatment. So he um, definitely got me on my feet both on treatment and off treatment that's cool (laughs) literally um so in conclusion i want to start where we began tell me what makes you happy and how today how you would redefine happiness for yourself so what makes me happy today is knowing that i'm healthy number one um number two for me happiness comes from being grateful so um gratefulness you know, is, it, it can be really hard to grasp when you're going through a tough time, but it, it's, uh, happiness definitely shaped, well, great, gratefulness was really shaped my focus on happiness, was, um, you know, everything happens for a reason, and although you may not know what the next day will bring, it's so important to be grateful for everything that you have in the moment Mm -hmm. and so I think that's one of the biggest takeaways of how I truly feel happy today thank you so much for for giving me uh the time to share your story and I'm sure our audience has got to love it as well and any any final words for for the be present organization and the audience out there um no it's just be grateful (laughs) yeah be present be grateful yeah thank you so much Sana thank you